Having been through the toughest year of my career, I can only imagine um, what President Masisi has been through, leading a country through something that is completely unprecedented, and there is no textbook to give you any advice on how to do it. But I also say, said um, that I know he's done it with his typical empathy, decisiveness, clarity, etc. So it gives me great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce the keynote speaker and hand over to his honour, the President of Botswana. Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Director of Ceremonies, Your Honour, the Vice President, Mr. Slamba Tsohwane of the Republic of Botswana. The Honourable Minister Mwahi, the Minister of Mineral Resources, Green Technology and Energy Security. Honourable Ministers here present. Mr. Elias Mahosi, the Permanent Secretary to the President. Mr. Bruce Cleaver, De Beers Group CEO. Mr. Noel Moroka, the Chairman of De Beers Group and Resident Director in Botswana. De Botswana and De Beers Trading Company Botswana Board of Directors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good Botswana afternoon to you all. I'm delighted to address you on this momentous occasion, which is the inaugural virtual Diamond Week, Diamond Impact Week 2020, to communicate and interact with the global diamond industry in terms of the current and way forward of the industry as well as to strengthen the strategic partnership between the government of Botswana and the De Beers Group. Indeed, Botswana also wishes to assure all our stakeholders that we will continue to work with them in order to achieve mutually successful outcomes for all players in the industry. Interacting with you virtually is indeed exciting as it shows the power of digital media which is one of the tools of the fourth industrial revolution that my government has prioritized in its endeavor to achieve a national transformation agenda. From the outset, let me recognize the presence of everyone who is on this webinar from all corners of the world and express my sincere gratitude to you for the passion, the love, and the interest that you have for our dear country, Botswana. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as you're all aware, since the outbreak of COVID-19 in December of 2019, lives have been lost. Economies shaken and businesses brought to their knees. The pandemic has further affected families in an unimaginable manner, leaving behind a trail of pain and despair. The diamond industry, which is the mainstay of our economy, has not been spared from the devastating impact of COVID-19, thus leaving our economy extremely weakened. The theme for this year's Diamond Impact Week 2020, recovery, rejuvenation and growth, serves to remind us that no matter how devastating the effect of COVID-19 is on us, we must recover and prosper again. I want to emphasize that working together as a collective is key to our success. As the adage goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with someone. There is indeed power in unity. And therefore, if we are united in purpose, we will achieve the targets that we have set for ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, Botswana continues to put up a spirited fight against COVID-19. We are truly thankful for the support we continue to receive from governments across the world and the corporate entities within and outside Botswana, without whom our success would not be possible. In this regard, I want to recognize the support that this country has received from the DPS Group since the outbreak of the pandemic. I'm grateful that the DPS Group has donated 20 million Fula to the National COVID-19 Relief Fund, which has, among others, helped government to procure the two PCRs that Bruce talked about machines, testing machines, as well as offer support to relevant stakeholders that are dedicated to ending gender-based violence in Botswana. Ladies and gentlemen, it goes without saying that the close relationship between the diamond industry 
and the tourism sector is quite significant in its contribution to Botswana's development agenda. However, the two sectors have been badly affected by COVID-19. To this end, I want to take this opportunity to pay homage to all players in the diamond value chain for their continued resilience over the recent months of COVID-19. Even though diamond sales dropped significantly in the first and second quarters of 2020, you all continued to save the industry from total collapse. And to this extent, we're beginning to notice an improvement in sales, albeit minimally. Therefore, my message to those in the diamond industry is that Botswana is now open for business and the local beneficiation initiative is now operational with international transactions taking place. Ladies and gentlemen, the tourism sector, which is also one of the country's highest performing industries, has experienced extreme losses. However, I am grateful that Botswana is slowly opening up her borders for international travelers, which I believe will resuscitate the tourism industry. In this respect, I want to encourage you to continue your visit to Botswana to support our tourism. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, although we are launching this Diamond Impact Week today, events of the week kick-started in earnest from the 30th of November with the launch of the De Beers Group Building Forever Strategy. I'm informed that this strategy will enable the De Beers Group to collaborate as appropriate with communities where the company is operational. I am also happy to note that other activities to be delivered this week include the annual W Summit. The summit is a platform for women in business to discuss pertinent issues related to their success. I'm also aware that there will be a youth entrepreneurship webinar, which will help our young people to interact and network with other entrepreneurs. These programs are all aligned to our national development strategy that aims to enhance the inclusion of women and youth in business. I am delighted that my dear wife, Mrs. Neo Masisi, the first lady is a patron of the W Summit. And I want to believe that her direct involvement will help ensure that the issue of women in development, leadership and business are amplified and addressed. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled to learn that today we will witness the launch of the Sweepstakes Initiative, which aims to recognize Botswana's frontline workers who continue to demonstrate patriotism, resilience and selflessness in their line of duty during their fight, this fight against COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me now at this juncture to express my profound gratitude to Honorable Minister Lefo Kumwahi the Minister of Minerals, Green Technology and Energy and Security. To you, Mr. Bruce Cleaver, the DBS Group Chief Executive Officer, and their teams for working together around the clock to make the Diamond Impact Week 2020 possible. In conclusion, I wish you a very successful deliberations during this important week. I believe that you'll be able to discuss issues that will help strengthen our partnership for the development of Botswana and prosperity of our people. I thank you enormously for your attention. Apulaini. Pula, thank you very much, Your Excellency and Bruce for the messages, which are really motivating, inspirational, and that is providing hope for the recovery, rejuvenation, and growth of the diamond industry and the world at large. Now, going to the main discussion of today, I would like to welcome Mr. David Prager, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Brand Officer of the BS Group, who will be moderating the discussion between His Excellency and Bruce on the theme, Navigating Change, the Role of Leadership, Our Recovery, Rejuvenation and Growth. Over to you, David. Chris, thank you so much, and Your Excellency, thank you for those words. I. I remarked earlier as we were starting today's session that last time uh, Bruce and I had the privilege of joining you on stage was in Las Vegas at the JCK show last year as we were just getting into summer. And uh, I know it sounds cliche, but who could have imagined 
where <laughs> where we find ourselves uh, a little bit more than a year later, but uh, still together and still focused on the future of Botswana and the future of diamonds. And it has clearly been a year of first, a year of sadness, a year of loss that is, of course, undeniable, um, but also a year of innovation and and hope. And uh, what we plan to do for the next 30 minutes or so is really have a discussion with you and with Bruce about what it's like to be a political leader and a corporate leader uh, in a time like this. So Your Excellency, if you would, my first question um, is for you. And, and I think probably not since the Second World War, has there really been a singular event, a singular moment that's gripped the attention of all world leaders all at the same time. Can you just help people understand what the early days of the pandemic were for you? What factors did you have to balance around health and economic health? Uh, and how did you set about leading your government in those first uncertain days? Yes, thank you very much, um, uh, David. You know, uh, Botswana, as uh, most people would know, is a third world developing country. It's upper middle income classified as such. And uh, we have, um, you know, the aspirations to succeed in the shortest possible time, as any aspirational people would. Uh, we aspire to have realized uh, our high income status by 2036. And um, uh, the diamond industry, is central to that. It always has been since our found, founding in 1966. And so when we, um, you know, ended the year last year, um, soon after the general elections, if you recall, uh, we were full of spirited hope and optimism. We had our manifesto to deliver. We had lots of promises to make. We were charged up, very youthful leadership, you know, and. Uh, uh, Technosaurus leadership, and you know they they were really raring to go. We prepared our budget. Budget session is in February of every year. We delivered our budget, and believe you me, we got the shock of our lives as we were going through it, and we woke up every day and said, you know, should we continue? Should we stop right here? And when this devastating reality began to hit us. COVID-19. And isn't it remarkable that a virus, you know, something microscopic, if at all, could cause such havoc? But yes, it did. It totally undermined the budget we have put in place. And so one of the biggest tasks was for me to go before our nation, having not so long before that gone before them and told them how beautiful the world is going to be, to tell them hey, it's not going to happen. So we've had to face this very tough reality of telling people the hard truth that we've got to divert resources to deal with this imminent threat. And uh, so we began to put together structures in place to plan our response, you know, preparation for that response. And uh, it's been a long haul, and in this long haul, it's drawn the best out of some of, you know, our institutions, our people. It's uh, brought uh, our country together. There's an unparalleled commitment to digitization. And, you know, very few people argue with it now. There's a, a real commitment to acting in a patriotic manner. And so I am a proud president and leader of Botswana, who, when the world faced its most challenging moment um, stood side by side with my people and convinced ourselves, as we do believe, we will overcome. So, yes, tough it is, but gosh, we will deal with this problem head on. Do you know, Your Excellency, having Having spent some time around you over the past several years, I know you carry the well-being of all Botswana on your shoulders. What is that? What toll does that take on you as a leader, as a man, and as a head of state? 
Well, besides the obvious, I mean, uh, first I'm human. You know, I, I, I sleep, eat, get tired, um, get irritated, enjoy myself. So the pressures or the burden, particularly given the COVID, you know, a reality is that it just uh, is, it depletes a lot of energy out of you. Um, it also takes you away from the family a lot. I mean, I, I probably have hit the record of the number of um, uh, quarantines I've been in because uh, we're so careful about um, uh, ensuring that we don't make any exceptions to anybody. So if I'm exposed, I mean, I just came this morning from my latest quarantine um, after I, I went through a test. Uh, but uh, it's important to show that as a leader. And it can be quite um, uh, taxing emotionally, uh, particularly when you've got to withstand, um, particularly the earlier criticisms, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, one, one is up to it because, you know, once you step up into leadership, you do expect uh, all that to come. And being a leader means you must make sure you push everybody through and uh, you come out succeeding. So, no, I'm, I am I'm quite motivated. Um, and so I, I, I recharge my motivation uh, by uh, introspection, meditation, um, and uh, uh, I wish I did more of it, uh, exercise, I cycle, right? And I go to the cattle ropes. I mean, I'm a Motswana, eh? I, I, won't, I won't tell you about my exercise regime, but <laughs> I think one thing uh, none of us have done enough of in lockdown is, is exercise. Thank you, Excellency. Bruce, you know, very early in the year at De Beers, we started to see the impact of COVID in China. And I remember us sitting around the table and looking at what was happening. And as it gravitated to the Western markets, the diamond pipeline really froze in place. There was next to no mining, there was no manufacturing, and most retail had gone into lockdown. And it was at that moment that you really took it as an opportunity to pivot our operations around the world, but particularly in Southern Africa, um, to focus on, as you said in your remarks, preparing for and responding to the pandemic in our producer countries. But given the significant financial stress we were seeing on our business and other businesses in the value chain, I know there were a lot of people external to our business that were asking us if that was the prudent thing to do, or if rather we should shut down and lock down and batten down until uh, and preserve our finances until the crisis passed. Can you talk a little bit about why that really wasn't an option for us and why you decided to respond as you did? Thanks, David. Um, yeah, and I guess similar to His Excellency, although on a much smaller scale, we were faced with a similar issue, which is when you know, that no one had seen before. And the levels of demand or lack of demand that we saw in the second quarter, we don't have on record, frankly, other than the Great Depression, even 2008 and nine, when there was a significant drop in demand, there was some demand. But, you know, we were, we were guided by two things, which is the one is that, you know, as, as His Excellency says, this, this will pass. Um, the world will get through this and we will get through this together and there will be a better future for us. And so it was important that we, uh, we're ready for that when it happens. So um, we never, and certainly would never, lose the faith that there will be a, a future for us and a future for the diamond industry and hopefully a, a very good one. Um, the first thing we focused on rightly, as we did with all our, our um, partners, is safety. So um, beyond the mines being shut around the world for a relatively short space of time, and that was really to put safety protocols in place and to ensure that we had the testing procedures we spoke about earlier in place and we could isolate people and we could help people where they needed help. It was important to us as much as possible to keep the businesses going and again working in partnership with governments because they clearly needed to have a similar view, which they did. And that was because we felt the worst thing we could do at that point was to put people out of work in any way, shape or form. It was really important that we kept our little piece of the value chain of the world going because many people depend on us and we depend on many people. Um, many, pe many people in the supply chain couldn't exist if we stopped operating. People's health is, is going to be negatively impacted if they're not working and they're not being paid. So it was always in our minds as much as possible and bearing in mind we had to reduce production because demand was much less, that we 
found a way of keeping the value chains going and keeping the supply chains going so that the people who depend on us and we depend on other people um, could at least keep some economic activity going. That's an important way we felt of helping communities. And I'll come back to the health point. You can't be healthy unless you're eating properly and you can't be healthy unless you fed properly. And that's very difficult when the entire global supply chain shuts down. So our objective was always within reason and as safely as we possibly could to keep those supply chains going because we felt that was good for everybody and including us, of course. Thank you, Bruce. And Your Excellency, Botswana has certainly and sadly felt the hardships of the pandemic. But it's also true to say the country has probably come through 2020 uh, and through the health crisis um, better than perhaps uh, most countries around the world. Why is that? What has been specific to the Botswana approach, do you think, um, that uh, has, uh, has meant that you've been able to weather COVID uh, perhaps better? You know, um, it's significant to point out that uh, there's been a, a lot of embracement of the um, legislative requirements and regulations that are put out by the public. Um, and so when, when people comply on the main um, and when institutions step up and they, uh, you know, internalize this as a problem, um, it does uh, help. Uh, we were fortunate also in that uh, we were able to put in place quite stringent measures to control populations. And our legal instruments at our disposal, which are still at play, uh, we, we used quite early on. We uh, put in place a state of emergency through parliament uh, solely to deal with COVID. And it's really just to manage the movement of persons when you could, uh, and at the same time, preserve the integrity of the economy. Because if you use any other instrument, uh, you would not. And finally, it's uh, you know our resolve as a young nation state, uh, fairly new uh, government after elections, to make sure that we come out better. So we re-strategized so that we don't waste this crisis and the energy and zeal to um, uh, substitute things that we've been importing uh, and that we can spirit emerged so strongly. And that's what we used to ride on as we put together our economic um, uh, transformation plan. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of motivation to, to do so much more. And the, the policy uh, uh, thrusts that we put in place are, are quite in support of that. So you'll see a lot more of that. Uh, as sad as it is, but uh, we're not going to waste this crisis. Well, thanks, Your Excellency. It's so interesting because clearly one of the most, the hardest hit sectors around the world has been international travel. And Botswana really relies on international travel, both business travels. You know, at De Beers, we have uh, 10 sites a year in Gaborone every five weeks, and also clearly tourist travel uh, to the Delta. You mentioned in your remarks earlier that Botswana is open for business. Can you talk more about that and, and the message for international travelers? Well, sure. Uh, we opened our international airports, the majority of them from the 1st of December, um, having put in very stringent uh, protocols, uh, which we publicized quite widely, and uh, we trained our staff. And uh, on the 15th of this month, uh, we are opening up uh, more land borders. And the purpose of that is to facilitate the movement of persons in a safe manner uh, to reignite in the, the economy and particularly in the tourism space, particularly in the diamond space. So yes, I tell all the diamond tiers out there that uh, the site holders, uh, they're welcome to come to Botswana. Uh, they'll be you know, fantastically treated. Um, the health protocols are quite in place. Evacuation plans are solid. And uh, uh, we, we've actually put in a, a, our bid to, to, to procure uh, uh, the vaccine um, once it becomes available. So uh, we, we're roaring to go. That's great. I know, I know Bruce tends to be in Botswana in normal times every two or three weeks. So I know he's got an itch to get back as quickly as, quickly as he can and we'll be there soon. And Bruce, on Monday, 
uh, of this week, uh, De Beers launched uh, its 12 very ambitious Building Forever goals uh, on our mission to 2030. Um, they're about improving people's lives, they're about protecting the natural world, and I know from sitting with you around the table that you are determined that we will achieve these and galvanize our business, our partners, even our consumers uh, with us on the journey. So I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to ask you about Building Forever specifically, but just more broadly, the role of business. What is the role of business in supporting recovery, particularly after COVID? Thanks, David. And that's that's a great question. I think just if I may, just to touch on something the president mentioned, um, with the borders reopening and people having been cooped up in lockdown for all this period of time, um, if any of you out there have not been to the Okavango, you should really consider taking this opportunity to get there as soon as you can. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be on safaris in many places in the world, and there is nowhere that comes close to being as good as the Okavango. So I think everyone involved in the diamond industry should really make a commitment to get up there at least once and hopefully more than once. It is, quite frankly, a life-changing experience. So um, I'd certainly encourage support there. Just And of course, one of our 12 ambitious goals, of course, is, is um, net positive biodiversity impact and protecting the natural world is such an important part of what we do. It fits very naturally into our business and it fits very naturally, of course, into Botswana, given, given what I've just mentioned. You, you know, for us, when we, when we launched these 12 goals, um, and they all really have become for us core business, there was a time when many years ago when I think sustainability was an interesting thing to do, but businesses maybe did it on the side of the core business. And when you hit a downturn, as you always do in cyclical businesses, it was the first place people went to reduce costs. We've tried very hard to make these 12 goals core business for us. And it really does come back to the point you've made. Uh, you know, um, all businesses need to be welcomed in the environments and the communities in which they operate. And if they're not, they can't succeed. Forget about the financial results, they can't succeed. And so for us, some of, many of these goals are about making sure that we leave a positive lasting impact in our communities and in the natural world after we no longer are around. And some of the ones that, that we've spoken about that are really pertinent now are things like a commitment to create four jobs um, for every one job in our operations. That's a big commitment to make by 2030, but that's the kind of thing I think if businesses do, um, they will help in the recovery, and of course they will they will help make themselves more welcome by the community. So I think that's a bit of a win-win for everybody. You know, that we spoke earlier too about the commitment to um, assist 10,000 female entrepreneurs around our communities, because we know that actually those folks generally reinvest more of the proceeds of their businesses back into the communities, sadly, than men do. And so that's a really great place for us to um, focus our efforts. So those are two examples of the things that I think businesses should be doing to help the recovery. But as I see it, it's a it's a win-win situation. So if you can do this in the, in the right way, I think it'll be good for um, the, the countries in which we are privileged to operate, but it'll be good for our own business as well. So I, I think businesses should look at this as an opportunity to strengthen their partnerships in a way that works for everybody. Because I think, as the president said earlier, that's got to be the way of the future. You know, there's going to be less to go around, so we're going to have to work even more closely to deliver what is almost always a common goal between us. Your Excellency, Excellency. when we were last together in Las Vegas at the JCK show, one of the things you spoke about that stuck with me was the really profound role that diamonds have had in helping to drive Botswana's economic expansion over the past half century and still today. What would be your message to the role diamonds will play in Botswana's recovery, wherever uh, the industry sits, be it in America or India or China? Central. The role of diamonds in the recovery for Botswana will always be central. Central in the sense that it is through diamonds that we've achieved what we have now. And if you are to recover, you've got to, you know, make the best, do the best with what you already have, which is from diamonds, the skill sets, the infrastructure, the systems, the institutions, the governance systems. So diamonds, which we have a competitive advantage in, still can never be excluded from the central role they play 
in recovery. So whatever we want to do going into the future, we can never not deal with our diamonds <clears throat> in a manner that will uh, promote uh, growth and recovery. And clearly, it also talks to the partnerships that we have. We've got to hold hands, you know, figuratively and literally to make sure that we drive this together. And so our mining operations, our exploration operations, our um, uh, knowledge-based economy research, um, you know, intellectual capital, um, value addition, value chains, we've got to be working on these all the time. And diamonds remain central to Botswana. I don't see how you can even call the name Botswana without diamonds or even say there were diamonds without Botswana. Thank you, Excellency. And, you know, Bruce, on that subject, you know, we've seen, um, you know, obviously the market was very difficult uh, earlier in the year, but it has come back. It's come back in China and it's coming back in America. De Beers expanded its Diamond Insight reports, which we issue annually with our uh, intelligence on consumer preferences. Um, and we expanded it this year to launch uh, flash reports so that retailers and members of the industry could understand uh, what was happening and how consumer sentiment was changing through COVID and through the associated lockdowns. Can you talk a little bit about what we saw coming out of those flash reports? What insights came through uh, that people should know about in the industry for what consumers are looking for now from now? Sure, thanks, David. And so, as you say, we launched these, we do them a lot, but we did significantly more through the lockdown than we normally do these flash reports because we felt it was important we kept talking to the diamond industry. And that the point I made earlier that people um, understood our view that there was going to be a future and we would get through this and we would get through this well. So, we did a lot of research, as we always do. Um, and we published the results of this research, consumer research mostly, in these flash reports. And every one of them told us stuff that I think is encouraging, and, and I think it's encouraging for the future of the diamond industry. No matter how bad it got, lockdowns, when people were all locked down originally, and COVID got people to think about what's really important to them and what isn't. And it, the thing that came out the top of all these pieces of research is relationships really matter. In fact, they matter more in these times when you are locked up because you have time to reflect on what really matters and maybe all these external things that you normally are dealing with are uh, less visible. And diamonds, of course, are perfectly positioned to, to fill that because they are given or purchased at great moments in people's lives and they mark momentous things in people's lives. And they're a celebration of joy and a celebration of uh, personal success or success in a relationship. So from day one, it was clear to us from this that um, there was no reason to think that people were less invested in the diamond dream because of COVID. In fact, on the contrary, there was an opportunity for those who did it well and those who did their marketing well around the Christmas season to try and take what would, would be clearly a smaller share of wallet, but direct it to things that are more meaningful. And so I think that was the first thing that came out of it. The second thing that came out of it, and to the discussion we had earlier on, on building forever, is that millennials and Generation Z in particular, quite rightly, and I, mean, I know we would all agree quite light, rightly, are very focused on ensuring that their purchases have done some good. Um, they're not people who just don't think about that kind of thing. They think about it all the time, as they should. So the diamond um, industry has done tremendous good around the world. And of course, the business has been involved in tremendous good being done. So there's an opportunity here for businesses that can tell that story, and particularly for brands that can tell that story. Because consumers, Generation Z and uh, millennials, are very clearly by brands whose social values are the same as theirs. So we got two very powerful pieces of research out of those flash reports, which, as I said, led us to be confident that although there'll be a difficult times ahead, no doubt, um, that, that if we do things right as the beers and as all of us in the industry, we should still have a very rosy and happy future. So, you know, things are different, but fundamentally, people still desire this magnificent product. We've all got to do better at getting our messaging out, getting the story of the good out, and um, getting people to understand all of those things. But there's no reason to be anything other than positive about the future. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. And as we come to a close of that half hour, I'll just ask one more question really for both of you. And um, Bruce, I'll ask you first and allow His Excellency to have the last words. But as, as leaders, uh, public leaders, political 
and corporate. Um, what what one insight would you give those watching about what COVID has taught to, taught you or reaffirmed to you about leadership? Yeah, I think every one of us has been through a year, as we both said earlier, that we would hope not to go through again, but it's taught us a great deal. I suppose from, from my point of view, a couple of things are obvious. The first one is, and, and His Excellency actually touched on this in his first answer, honesty and authenticity really matter. It's amazing how, uh, in, in a small way in an organization, obviously much bigger in a country, but you know, people pull together when they believe that the leadership is honest, authentic, and genuine, and is focused in the right direction. So I think that's one thing that was particularly clear. I think this honesty point is a good one, though, because there were times we didn't know what was coming next, and we were honest about that. So that's, I suppose, one piece. And the other one, if you'll indulge me, another one is being true to your values. If, you know, if you if you can stick to your values through difficult times, I think it's going to be a lot easier to deliver the future in slightly easier times. And I think there's another leadership point there is that if businesses that are, and, and no doubt I'm sure we'll have countries that's, that um, you know, stick to their values through really difficult times, for sure are going to be those that succeed the best when the good times come back. Thanks, David. Thanks, Bruce, Your Excellency. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, David. I think one of the things that has uh, come through for me very positively is that uh, you know um, working together sincerely uh, has been a very powerful lesson uh, when faced with a crisis and uh, being transparent about it being direct about it forthright and resolute um, otherwise uh, if you don't make decisions and you don't have uh, any reasoning for making those decisions and they are not embraced, particularly in a democratic country like ours. Um, it just is not good. So I, I, I stand uh, uh, really on the strength of the, the culture of democracy and consultative um, governance that uh, has been developed over time. And I can only thank my predecessors um, for this and our forefathers and for mothers uh, for this. Well, thank you, Bruce and Your Excellency. Thank you um, specifically for your time and willingness to engage in a discussion. It has been an extraordinary year and uh, we can only hope uh, good things are to come and that we're able to be back in country as soon as possible and with you and uh, all those who we love. So thank you. And with that, Chris, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you very much, Bruce, for the insightful discussion. Thank you very much, David, for uh, moderating this discussion, which really, I think, touched into the intricacies of the role of our leadership during this difficult time and how um, their role will help us nav navigate the change um, for the recovery, rejuvenation, and growth of the economy of the diamond industry. To all our attendees and participants, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that we enjoyed uh, the session and learned uh, uh, quite a lot from the discussion between our two leaders. Remember to consistently practice COVID-19 prevention measures while at home, and at work. Keep safe and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.